For a knight to ascend to the esteemed rank of master, they must shatter entrenched stereotypes, often wielded like ancient swords in the realm of tradition. Enter Joshua Sanders, a legendary spear knight renowned as the great hero across the vast expanse of the Igrant continent. With valor unmatched, Joshua swiftly quelled the civil unrest plaguing the Avalon Empire. Yet, his tale takes a tragic turn as he falls victim to betrayal, poisoned by those he once trusted, his own superiors. In his final moments, surrounded by those who orchestrated his demise, Joshua implores them for answers. They reveal a twisted logic, citing his fervent devotion to mana an energy diametrically opposed to the holy power revered by the empire. Such clashes within the body spell doom for ordinary souls, yet Joshua, fueled by his singular passion for spear mastery, clings to life. Confounded by the treachery of his superiors, Joshua's aspirations were never tainted by ambition for the throne. His only desire was to showcase the magnificence of the spear and alleviate the stigma of his birth as a concubine's son. As the echoes of civil strife fade into memory, Joshua finds himself in the company of Emperor Caesar von Britain, the stalwart guardian of the Avalon Empire. With a heavy heart, Joshua confronts his betrayers, seeking understanding amidst the tumult of his betrayal. It is then that Evergrant, master of the Tower of Magic, steps forth, shedding light on a darker truth. He warns of existential threats lurking in the shadows, Threats so profound that even the newfound peace following the civil war cannot shield the empire from their malevolence. In the emperor's pursuit of dominance, Joshua emerges as an obstacle, a force to be reckoned with. Even seasoned martial artists, honing their craft over decades, pale in comparison to Joshua's innate prowess, his mere presence casting a shadow of uncertainty over the empire's ambitions. But Joshua can completely cover that massive spear, the size of two people, an aura. How many foes has Joshua slain with that spear? Evergrant further states that surpassing Aura, a long time ago, he knew that Joshua had surpassed another wall. Suddenly, Joshua feels agonizing pain in his chest. When Evergrant thanks Joshua for everything up until now, stating that if it weren't for Joshua, they wouldn't be here today, he genuinely expresses gratitude. As they bid farewell to Joshua and leave, seeing him on his last breath, Joshua shouts from behind, saying that this is not the end of everything. Then, we see a magic explosion circle under Joshua. Shocked to see the magic explosion circle, Joshua thinks that at this speed, he only has five minutes at most. Frustrated, Joshua thinks that it's pointless. The legendary Spear Knight, once a title of honor, now feels false. Ultimately betrayed by his longtime friend, Joshua believed in, he now feels like just a second-rate knight destined to die namelessly in this forest. As Joshua tries to escape the range of the magic explosion circle, he senses mana from his spear named Lukia, the red spear known as the Grim Reaper of the battlefield. Trying his best to reach for the spear, Joshua thought that a special strength would be hidden inside it, but to think Lukia would reveal that strength in this moment. At that moment, Joshua couldn't think clearly. He simply tries his best to reach his spear. When Joshua finally reaches the spear, the magic explosion circle reaches its limit and explodes, causing a huge blast that even makes a massive hole in the ground. Now, in the Land of Knights, the Grand Duke of the Avalon Empire, Joshua Sanders, meets an empty fate that contradicts his fame as the undefeated Spear Knight. The scene shifts, and we see a kid waking up on a farm. It's Joshua. Confused about what's going on, Joshua wonders how he should have died in that explosion. Then Joshua runs outside and sees himself in the water reflection, realizing that Joshua's body has gotten younger. When Joshua checks his surroundings, he realizes that this is where Joshua lived in his previous life. Joshua thinks that he has returned to the past. Realizing this, Joshua smiles and thinks that another opportunity has come to him. In Joshua's previous life, because of Caesar von Britain, Joshua was killed. But in this life, things will be different. As Joshua was getting happy about getting another chance, three knights come to Joshua asking why Joshua isn't cleaning up around the horses as they told him to. Joshua recognizes these three knights. They are the Agnes Duchy's troops, the Centurions Ralche, Lloyd, and Gort. Lloyd, with a serious expression, tells Joshua that he should answer when someone is talking to him. Ralche tells Lloyd that he has forgotten that Joshua can't talk. So, of course, Joshua wouldn't be able to answer. Hearing this, Joshua thinks that he pretended as if he couldn't talk since he would get hit more if he opened his mouth. Lloyd looks around and says that he hasn't seen Lucia for a while. Ralche tells Lloyd to be quiet because what if the Duke hears about this, as the Duke looks after that maid Lucia once in a while. Hearing this, Joshua remembers his mother, Lucia, the exclusive maid of the Agnes Duchy. 
Joshua is the illegitimate child of the maid, who was held by Duke Agnes. Because the troops knew about that fact, they tormented Joshua, who had noble blood, venomously, and felt some kind of vicarious pleasure, especially these three who were in front of Joshua. Joshua had pledged to surely take revenge on them one day. Lloyd says to Joshua that he needs to see Alicia for some reason today. Ralche tells Lloyd to stop talking, as what if someone hears him? Lloyd tells Ralche not to worry as there is no one else here at this remote stable excluding this kid. Lloyd says that Duchess Vanessa said that even if they get rid of Lucia and this kid without anyone else knowing, then Duchess Vanessa would take responsibility. Lloyd says that right now is the best timing, but Lucia isn't here. They both say that since Lucia isn't here, let's play around with this kid. Hearing these three talking about his mother, Joshua, filled with anger, thinks that he has no intention of letting these bastards go who have insulted his mother. Joshua tries to channel mana into his hand, checking if he can still use mana. The way that Joshua performs the mana technique he learned is different from the normal ones before he regressed. The mana technique that Joshua discovered at the ancient ruins with his favorite spear, Lucia, allowed him to reach the peak quickly due to its amazing impact that could shake the world. The important thing is that the mana technique that Joshua practiced had a completely different operational method. This technique isn't done by accumulating mana in the mana hole located under the abdomen, as is typical, but by using the mana scattered in the surroundings. It's not limited by a small plate called the mana hole. Instead, it absorbs mana with the whole body. This technique also concentrates the mana where it is needed to burst it out in an instant. Joshua didn't go through the process of forming a mana hole that everyone who uses mana typically undergoes, and he skipped the process that takes others' years entirely. So, there is no helping Joshua's fast start as a mana user. Gort tells the others to surround Joshua and beat him up, expressing that his anger is going through the roof just by looking at Joshua's face. As Gort gets ready to attack Joshua, Joshua closes his eyes and starts to gather mana. Seeing Joshua standing with his eyes closed, they think he's scared. But in reality, Joshua is trying to gather a handful of mana to make a move. Before Joshua regressed, it took him 10 years to move this fistful of mana, but in this life, Joshua already knows how. Then, as Gort goes to attack Joshua, before he can strike, Joshua uses his mana fist and punches Gort right in the stomach, causing him to fall to the ground after taking the punch. Both Ralche and Lloyd are shocked to see this. Joshua, on the other hand, after using the mana fist, feels something sticky and disturbing in his abdomen. As Joshua feels the sensation under his abdomen, which should be completely empty, he is sure that it is something he couldn't feel before his regression. Seeing this, Lloyd comes forward, taking out his sword to attack Joshua. Joshua thinks that it's too dangerous to go against a trained soldier with a young physique wielding a longsword. However, if Joshua can knock out Lloyd, who is advancing towards him, then there is a chance that Ralche won't attack him, as Ralche was the most cautious out of these three. Joshua tries to use the mana fist one more time. As Lloyd charges at Joshua, Joshua quickly ducks Lloyd's attack and uses his mana fist once more, punching Lloyd right in the face, which knocks him out. Surprised to see this, Ralche thinks that who knew that a kid who can't even talk was hiding such power. It could be a coincidence once, but twice? Joshua, on the other hand, starts to feel intense pain with only using this much mana. He thinks that Ralche, someone who was promoted all the way to Centurion, has more than just skills. So, Ralche is no better than Lloyd and Gort. But even someone with Ralche's skills is dangerous. However, Joshua knows that he can't show Ralche his weak state. With a serious expression, Joshua tells Ralche to pass on this message. Ralche is shocked to hear Joshua talking. Joshua starts to walk towards Ralche and tells him that from this moment onwards, anyone who insults Joshua's mother, including Ralche, with Joshua's name on the line, Joshua will take them down. Scared to see Joshua like this, Ralche starts running. As Ralche leaves, Joshua starts to feel exhausted and falls to the ground. Then the scene shifts to the palace, where the workers discuss the rumor about a kid in the stables beating the crap out of three centurions. One worker says that young Master Joshua defeated three centurions even though he is five years younger than Master Babel. Something doesn't feel right. Another worker dismisses these rumors, saying they are all exaggerated. How could a kid who was abandoned by his family a few days ago possibly beat three centurions with his bare hands? The worker speculates that if the rumors are true, then the standings of Duke Agnes's children in the succession may change. Even if Joshua's skills are recognized, he will never be able to defeat young Master Babel. 
Another worker agrees, stating that young Master Babel is a mana user now, whereas even the great Duke Agnes, who is now a master, was 16 when he became a mana user. But young Master Babel is only 14 and already a mana user, indicating that he must be an outstanding genius who will surpass even Duke Agnes one day. So who could ever compete against young Master Babel for the succession? It's simply impossible. Then, as the worker turns, he is shocked to see Joshua. With a serious look, Joshua tells the worker to go and inform the Duke that Joshua Von Agnes has arrived. The scene then shifts to Duke Agnes's office, where Ralche is also present. The Duke asks Ralche about his affiliation, and Ralche responds that he is from the 29th Battalion. The Duke instructs Ralche to bring the armor to him. As Ralche hands the armor to Duke Agnes, the Duke is surprised to see that Joshua is the one who damaged it. The knight named Chiffon warns the soldier to think carefully before answering and threatens that any lies will not be forgiven. Ralche assures Chiffon that he has not spoken a single lie. Hearing this, Duke Agnes asks Chiffon for his opinion on the matter and then asks how old Joshua is. Chiffon says that Joshua is nine years old, and the Duke is surprised to think that Joshua destroyed a suit of armor made of orc leather at that age with his bare hands. Well, it's possible if Joshua used mana. Surprised, Chiffon tells the Duke that this is impossible because there has not been a single case of someone being able to use mana in a real fight by the age of nine in the continent's history. Even if young Master Joshua turned out to be an unprecedented genius in history, one must at least be a highly talented beer ink knight to cover their bare hands with mana. So, Chiffon simply cannot believe that the nine-year-old Joshua was able to successfully achieve that. It seems more likely that these people were scared of others finding out that they were bullying young Master Joshua and came up with a nonsensical excuse with their good-for-nothing brains. Chiffon says that if the Lord allows it, then Chiffon will drag this man outside and teach him a lesson in public to fix their troops' deteriorating discipline. Scared, Ralche says that everything Ralche just said is the truth. Hearing this, Chiffon tells Ralche to tell the truth, or Chiffon will take him down right now. Scared, Ralche stated that he have told nothing but the truth. But before Chiffon could act, Duke Agnes stops him. Chiffon says that they cannot leave Ralche be after he spread a rumor. Duke Agnes says that they will discover the truth once they meet the person in question. The Duke says that it's about time he met Joshua for the first time and that he will go and see Joshua himself. Hearing this, Chiffon is surprised to see that Duke Agnes will meet with Joshua personally just to see the son of a concubine, as Duke Agnes has never even shown such interest in young Master Babel, who is known as the Empire's greatest genius. The Duke asks Chiffon where Joshua is, and Chiffon says that he received news that Joshua has arrived at the palace, so Joshua must be inside the first floor's waiting room. Duke tells Chiffon to lead the way as they leave the office. Then the scene shifts to the Agnes Palace corridor, where Babel sees Joshua. Frustrated, Babel doesn't understand why Joshua is here. Babel asks Joshua what he's doing here, but Joshua doesn't listen. With a dark aura surrounding him, Joshua looks at the picture of the current emperor of Avalon, Marcus Van Britten. Whenever Joshua sees this portrait, anger surges from deep inside him. Caesar Van Britten, Joshua thinks, that he will definitely take his revenge. Thinking Joshua is ignoring him, Babel lunged towards Joshua with a clenched fist, but Joshua's reflexes were swift. He intercepted Babel's punch with a deft maneuver, seizing it before it could land. Babel is surprised to see Joshua's strength and aura emitting from him. Babel thinks that the rumor of Joshua beating three soldiers must be true. However, Babel thinks that he won't go down without a fight. But as Babel is about to attack Joshua with mana, the Duke comes in with Chiffon and asks Babel what he and Joshua are doing. Surprised to see his father, Babel quickly kneels and greets his father. Duke Agnes asks Babel what he was doing, and Babel says that he and Joshua were exchanging heartwarming greetings. Confused hearing this, the Duke turns his attention to Joshua. Seeing Joshua not greeting the Duke, Chiffon gets frustrated and tells Joshua to mind his manners. Duke stops Chiffon, saying that his gaze is filled with spite. Seeing this, Joshua thinks that seeing the portrait reminded him of that emperor, and now the anger boiling inside him is about to explode. Joshua realizes that this isn't good, as Duke Agnes doesn't easily let go of people who show hostility before him, especially if the hostile person in question is his child. To Joshua's surprise, Duke Agnes tells him that if he is calmed down, then he should come closer to the Duke because Duke Agnes wants to personally check whether Joshua truly used mana or not. Babel is surprised to hear this, thinking that this lowly Joshua can use mana. Chiffon says to the Duke that it's pointless. The Duke tells Joshua to come closer. 
Surprised, Joshua thinks that Duke Agnes is one of the five masters of the vast empire, and Duke Agnes is far more sensitive to mana than others. If Duke Agnes finds any abnormal symptoms in Joshua's body, then Joshua's plans will go down the drain. But to Joshua's surprise, the Duke comes and grabs Joshua's hand to check whether Joshua can use mana. As Duke Agnes was checking if Joshua could use mana, Joshua thought that if the mana-sensitive Duke Agnes found something that Joshua didn't know, then Joshua's plans would all have to be adjusted. But to Joshua's surprise, Duke Agnes couldn't sense any mana from Joshua. Hearing this, Babel smirked, thinking that Babel knew, as there was no way Joshua could use mana. Shaphan said to Duke that of course there shouldn't be any mana from the start. Duke replied to Shaphan that he wasn't talking about the mana hole because as a human, there should be at least some basic mana, even in civilians, and even mere monsters have mana. But in Joshua, Duke Agnes couldn't feel any mana at all. Hearing this, Shaphan thought about the fact that there was no mana, which meant they were no different from an undead that moves with demonic power. Shaphan said that perhaps there were cases where some were naturally born without mana. Shaphan had heard stories about that. Duke Agnes said that rather than natural, there was something where the mana hole should have been, some sticky, bad energy that the Duke felt. Duke said that for now, he would watch over Joshua with a smirk on his face. Hearing this, Shaphan intervened and said that it didn't make sense. If young Master Joshua was born with a mana deficiency, didn't that mean the rumors were false? So Shaphan couldn't leave the centurion that spread those false rumors alone. Duke told Shaphan that the centurion was also an asset of the dukedom, and it wasn't a good idea to punish them for information that Shaphan wasn't comfortably certain about. Shaphan apologized to the duke for being too short-sighted. Then Duke told Joshua to live in the palace for a while, as there were plenty of empty rooms. Babel told Duke that Joshua couldn't stay at the palace, but before Babel could finish his sentence, Duke Agnes glared at Babel, saying, Is there a problem, Babel? Babel got scared and said that there was no problem. Duke Agnes informed Shaphan that starting tomorrow, he should begin teaching Joshua some fundamental night skills. If Joshua demonstrates promise, Shaphan is instructed to introduce him to the Crimson Knight's technique for harnessing mana. Surprised, Shaphan asked if Duke Agnes was talking about how to use mana, but young Master Joshua didn't have any mana. Duke told Shaphan that there was plenty of time, so both Duke and Shaphan would find out if they waited and saw, and it was even better if Joshua didn't have a natural mana deficiency. Duke said to Joshua that he would be looking forward to Joshua's return next year. Later, Shaphan escorted Joshua to the room that would be his during his stay. Observing Joshua's subdued demeanor, Shaphan couldn't help but wonder if the rumors about Joshua's inability to speak were true. Not a glimmer of joy crossed Joshua's face upon receiving such generous accommodations. Offering assistance, Shaphan advised Joshua to call upon him if needed before briskly exiting the room, the door slamming behind him. Joshua couldn't help but note the stark change in Shaphan's demeanor. Was it because they were no longer in the presence of Duke Agnes? Joshua pondered this as he settled onto his bed, yearning for sleep. However, the thought of Duke Agnes eagerly anticipating their meeting nagged at him. Duke Agnes, typically ensconced in the opulent confines of Akadi's Golden Castle, the capital of the Avalon Empire, must have returned to the fee for a reprieve. Joshua couldn't shake the feeling that Duke Agnes might be privy to information unknown to him. Whatever it was, the prospect of Duke Agnes harboring secrets posed a potential danger, one Joshua was determined to unravel. But Joshua sighed, feeling the weight of uncertainty pressing down upon him. More pressing than anything, Joshua believed, was the imperative to reclaim his original strength. With that goal in mind, he resolved to take action. Under the cloak of night, Joshua slipped out of the palace, utilizing his mana to move stealthily, leaving behind no trace of his passage. He found solace in the ease with which he could now wield his mana, realizing it might expedite his journey back to his former prowess. Yet, amidst his clandestine excursion, a sudden pang of pain gripped Joshua's stomach, signaling a disruption within his mana. He speculated whether the conflicting energies were of holy or demonic origin, their chaotic dance within him causing discomfort. To his astonishment, Joshua discovered Lucia's formidable presence intertwined with the conflicting energies, her power acting as a stabilizing force. Before Joshua could unravel the mystery further, the sound of approaching soldiers shattered the night's silence. Reacting swiftly, Joshua vanished from their sight, darting into the protective embrace of the forest. His destination clear in his mind, Joshua made his way towards his mother. As Joshua sprinted through the night, thoughts raced through his mind like a tempest. He couldn't shake the notion that Lucia held the key to the enigmatic trio of energies coursing through him. 
If he could harness them all as his own, Joshua believed, he could swiftly reclaim his lost strength. Meanwhile, the scene shifted to a humble hut, where tension crackled in the air like static electricity. Ralche, Lloyd, and Gort stood alongside Alicia, Joshua's mother. Lloyd's grip on Alicia tightened, his anger palpable. Gort and the others thirsted for vengeance, blaming Joshua for their tarnished reputations. In the chaos, Alicia attempted to flee, only to be met with violence. Lloyd's blow sent her crashing to the ground, a sickening thud marking her fall. Gort poised to strike the final blow, but Ralche intervened, his voice cutting through the tumult like a knife. He warned of Joshua's wrath should they proceed, urging restraint. Gort scoffed at Ralche's plea, accusing him of cowardice. With Duchess Vanessa's assurances of protection, Gort saw no reason to hesitate. Lloyd, equally unyielding, demanded Ralche's departure if he lacked the stomach for their vengeance. Just as Gort prepared to deliver the fatal blow, a voice pierced the tension, commanding them to halt. They turned to find Joshua standing before them, his presence a thunderbolt in the midst of their turmoil. With anger simmering in his veins, Joshua issued a chilling warning to the trio before him, their fate hanging by a threat. Ralche, trembling with fear, pleaded with Gort to flee, but Gort's frustration boiled over as he denounced Ralche's cowardice. Ignoring their banter, Joshua's voice cut through the tension like a blade. Come out now, he commanded, his gaze unwavering. Gort and Lloyd's laughter faltered as they prepared to attack, but Joshua's words held them at bay. Suddenly, a figure descended from the ceiling, catching everyone off guard. The knight, named Cain, was taken aback by Joshua's ability to sense his presence. Bearing the emblem of the Order of the Crimson Knights, Cain's arrival raised questions in Joshua's mind. Was Shafan behind this? As Lloyd, Gort, and Ralche greeted the knight with deference, Cain approached Joshua with a hint of disdain. So, this is the rumored child of a concubine, he mused. Joshua wasted no time in addressing the situation, questioning Cain about the soldier's attempt to harm a lady of the Duke's house. Abiding by the strict military code of the Duke's house, Joshua demanded clarity on how such situations were typically handled. Cain, taken aback by Joshua's commanding presence, found himself unable to refute the overwhelming force emanating from the young noble. In a moment of decisive action, Cain pivoted, drawing his sword with determination. With a steely resolve, he declared that any knights found guilty of attempting to harm a lady of the duke's house would face immediate and severe punishment. With lightning speed, Cain swiftly incapacitated Lloyd before turning his attention to Gort. Despite Gort's attempt to retaliate, Cain effortlessly evaded his strike and swiftly subdued him as well. Now, only Ralche remained. Trembling with fear, Ralche pleaded for forgiveness as Joshua's voice rang out from behind, urging Cain to halt. But Cain remained resolute, ignoring Joshua's plea as he pressed his sword against Ralche's throat. Ralche, desperate for mercy, begged for clemency, but Cain's fury brooked no negotiation. As Joshua stepped forward, intervening once more, Cain explained that he was merely carrying out immediate punishment for endangering the duke's wife. His demeanor grave, Cain made it clear that he would not let these knights escape lightly. Observing Cain's seriousness, Joshua speculated about his identity. Cain appeared to be one of the third-generation knights renowned within the duchy, belonging to the formidable Crimson Knights. Joshua surmised that Cain was likely the youngest among them. As the realization dawned upon Joshua that Cain had likely been assigned to observe him, he became certain of Cain's formidable prowess, evident in how effortlessly Cain subdued the centurions with mere swings of his sword. Curious about Cain's background, Joshua inquired about his master. Cain's response was unequivocal, Duke Agnes was his master. This revelation piqued Joshua's interest further, prompting him to delve deeper into their connection. Sensing a familiar intensity in Joshua's gaze, Cain couldn't help but draw parallels between Joshua and someone he knew. Upon Joshua's command, Cain reluctantly sheathed his sword. Ralche, filled with gratitude for Joshua's intervention, pledged his loyalty in return. But Joshua, resolute in his stance, refused Ralche's offer, declaring that he would never spare those who had harmed his mother. However, Joshua expressed confidence in Ralche's intelligence and urged him to relay the events of that night to others in detail. With a solemn warning hanging in the air, Joshua made it clear that any future transgressions would be met with severe consequences. With frustration etched across his features, Joshua asserted his intent to personally deal with those who dared to harm his mother. He dismissed Ralche with a curt command, his expression brooking no argument. As Ralche hastened away without a backward glance, Cain approached Joshua, noting the marked difference in his demeanor. Joshua's response was dismissive, 
a smirk playing at the corners of his lips as he referred to himself as the master's illegitimate child, the stable's vendor. Kane paused, considering Joshua's words before enlightening him about the knight's autonomy and choosing their master upon reaching the age of 23. Acknowledging that he would face this decision himself next year, Kane expressed his trust in his instincts. He vowed to continue watching over Joshua beyond his assigned duty. Hearing this, Joshua contemplated Kane's choice, concluding that Kane had likely made the right decision in choosing to serve the duchy's treasure, Babel von Agnes. As Kane contemplated the future, Joshua couldn't help but smile at his companion's eccentricity. Their exchange was interrupted by Alicia's awakening. Her smile radiated relief as she expressed her happiness at seeing Joshua safe. Without hesitation, Joshua enveloped his mother in a tight embrace, tears welling in his eyes as he vowed to protect her from that moment forward. With gratitude swelling in his heart, Joshua silently thanked the heavens for granting him a second chance to reclaim his youth, devoid of the regrets that had tainted his past. Determined to rewrite his story, Joshua resolved to shed his timidity and embrace his true potential, not as Joshua Von Agnes, the lowly illegitimate child, but as Joshua Sanders, hailed as the strongest spear in the continent's history. Meanwhile, in the grand halls of the Agnes Duchy's mansion, Duke Agnes inquired of Chiffon about Count Rebecca's unexpected visit. Chiffon informed the Duke that the Count had been escorted to the reception room. However, Chiffon revealed that Count Rebecca hadn't arrived alone this time leaving the Duke intrigued as he pressed Chiffon for more details. Chiffon's revelation that Count Rebecca had arrived accompanied by Miss Iceland prompted Duke Agnes to furrow his brow. He sensed that Count Rebecca was likely seeking to resolve some pressing matter, and the sudden appearance of an uncomfortable guest only added to his unease. Count Fonsel Jean Rebecca, though of lower status compared to Duke Agnes, commanded significant influence within the Empire. His daughter, Iceland Jean Rebecca, was equally notable. Iceland, a prodigious mage, had achieved Class II status at the tender age of nine, an accomplishment that spoke volumes of her innate talent. In a world where some were cursed with the inability to wield mana, Iceland was among the blessed few who possessed a natural affinity for it. This divine gift, known as the Blessing of Mana, granted its recipients the ability to sense and manipulate mana without the need for rigorous training. It was revered as one of the greatest gifts bestowed by the gods upon magicians. Duke Agnes sighed resigned to the fact that Count Fonsel would likely monopolize his time once more. It seemed that the rest of the day would be spent attending to the Count's concerns. Chiffon delivered the news to Duke Agnes with a tone that hinted at the passage of time. Babel will be fifteen next year, Chiffon remarked, implying the imminent approach of Babel's coming-of-age ceremony. Duke Agnes nodded thoughtfully, acknowledging the significance of the event. Babel has Lady Charles, Duke Agnes mused referencing the Font family's daughter who held considerable sway as a duchess in her own right. The Font family's wealth had secured them a duchy within the Avalon Empire, granting them significant influence. Chiffon suggested to Duke Agnes that Lady Charles might be a preferable choice, especially considering the Font duchy's standing. Duke Agnes, however, lamented the predictability of such arrangements. Chiffon couldn't help but perceive Duke Agnes's insatiable appetite for talent, which rivaled his thirst for military power. To Duke Agnes, skill was the paramount factor in evaluation, a trait that defined the ruler of the Agnes Duchy. Their conversation halted abruptly as Duke Agnes came to a standstill. Sensing something amiss, Chiffon inquired about Duke Agnes's sudden pause. Duke Agnes, after a moment of contemplation, broached a different topic. He asked after Joshua, revealing his intention to fulfill a promise he had made to bestow Iceland upon Joshua. Chiffon's astonishment was palpable upon hearing Duke Agnes's intention. In Chiffon's mind, the idea of pairing Iceland, blessed with the gift of mana, with Joshua, afflicted by the curse of mana disability, seemed incongruous. To Chiffon, it was akin to aligning two opposing forces, one brimming with magical potential, the other burdened by its absence. Meanwhile, outside the confines of the mansion, Joshua found solace in scaling the cliff that loomed north of the Agnes Duchy's garden. This rocky precipice held significance for him, for it was here that he had once sought solace in the wake of his mother's passing. In his exploration, Joshua stumbled upon a concealed tunnel, its secrets waiting to be unearthed. As Joshua ascended the cliff, his eyes scanned the rugged surface in search of the elusive tunnel. This was where he had first encountered Lucia, and he was determined to find it again. Spotting the entrance to the tunnel, Joshua carefully pricked his finger, allowing a drop of blood to fall onto the magic circle inscribed there. In an instant, a portal materialized before him, beckoning him to step through. 
Emerging on the other side, Joshua found himself in an ancient, dilapidated temple. Confusion clouded his mind as he surveyed his surroundings, realizing that this temple was not as he remembered it from his past life. In his previous existence, this place had been intact, its significance unmistakable. But now, it lay in ruins, a shadow of its former self. Approaching the altar at the temple's center, where Lucia had once been bound, Joshua's heart sank at the sight before him. Instead of Lucia, there was only a metal staff resting upon the stone surface. With a mixture of curiosity and apprehension, Joshua reached out and grasped the staff. To his surprise, the staff began to glow, its radiance enveloping Joshua before it vanished from his grip. Bewildered, Joshua scanned his surroundings, which now seemed to shimmer with an ethereal whiteness. Suddenly, a voice pierced the silence, drawing Joshua's attention behind him. Turning, Joshua beheld the metal staff, now seemingly imbued with life, beckoning him forth with a silent call. Joshua's astonishment echoed through the abandoned temple as he questioned the identity of the mysterious metal stick. To his disbelief, the stick revealed itself as Lukia, a demonic god's artifact. The revelation sent shivers down Joshua's spine. The spear he had wielded in countless battles throughout his previous life was, unbeknownst to him, a relic of dark origin. Furthermore, its appearance had undergone a transformation since their last encounter. Speculating on the reason for Lukia's altered appearance, Joshua contemplated the possibility that it had been sent back in time along with him. But Lukia wasted no time in addressing the urgent matter at hand. It warned Joshua of the detrimental effects the conflicting energies within his body would have on his lifespan. The only solution, Lukia explained, was for Joshua to swiftly regain his original strength and harness the tranquil energies within him. The task ahead seemed daunting as Lukia revealed that Joshua would need to reach the fourth stage of magic spearmanship to achieve this goal. Joshua's surprise was palpable. The ancient spear technique he had been mastering, known as magic spearmanship, was a formidable skill. In a world where swords reigned supreme among knights, this unique technique, forged through Joshua's mastery of mana, held unparalleled power. Despite being widely dismissed as inferior weapons, spears held a special place in Joshua's arsenal. Before his regression, only a select few could match Joshua's prowess on the battlefield. At that time, Joshua had reached the pinnacle of mastery in magic spearmanship, attaining the coveted stage 5. In a world where knights primarily wielded swords formed from mana, Joshua's proficiency with the spear set him apart. While the rank system categorized knights into various tiers, Joshua's skill transcended these boundaries. Even at stage 5, he stood unrivaled as the empire's greatest knight. Now, as Joshua contemplated reaching stage 4 once more, he recognized the significance of the achievement. At that level, he would be on par with the mightiest beer ink knights. Recalling his past accomplishments, Joshua believed that attaining this level of mastery shouldn't pose too great a challenge. However, the pressing issue lay in the constraints of time. Joshua's current condition made it difficult to train his mana effectively. Lukia's reassurance brought a glimmer of hope to Joshua. With Lukia's guidance, Joshua could harness mana with minimal adverse effects. Joshua's surprise was evident as he questioned the feasibility of such a feat Lukia remained steadfast, urging Joshua to focus on continuous self-improvement. With Lukia by his side, Joshua could navigate the complexities of mana manipulation and hone his skills relentlessly. Joshua envisioned a future where he stood at the pinnacle of his abilities, Lukia fully restored to her former power. It was then, Joshua believed, that his dreams would become reality. However, despite his determination, Joshua couldn't quite grasp Lukia's cryptic message. Before he could seek clarification, Joshua found himself back in the temple, clutching Lukia in his hand. Recalling Lukia's assurance that her presence would enable him to wield mana to some extent, Joshua decided to put her words to the test. He embarked on a mana cultivation technique unlike any other on the continent, a foundational step known as Stage 1 of Magic Spearmanship. With determination fueling his efforts, Joshua reached out to the ambient mana surrounding him. As he absorbed the energy, Joshua felt a surge of power course through him, marking his attainment of stage one. Eager to put his newfound abilities to the test, Joshua executed the first form of magic spearmanship with precision. In a single explosive burst, he concentrated mana into a focused point before launching it forward with unparalleled force. Witnessing his success, Joshua felt a surge of confidence. This was only the beginning. With unwavering determination, Joshua vowed to train tirelessly, driven by the desire to surpass his rivals and claim victory for himself. 
The grandeur of the Agnes Duchy's guest reception room unfolded as Duke Agnes made his entrance. His keen eyes scanned the room, noting the unexpected abundance of guests. Among them stood Cheryl, who offered a gracious greeting to the Duke. Curiosity piqued, Duke Agnes inquired about Cheryl's late-night visit. Cheryl explained that Count Cox, a distinguished vassal of House Font, had insisted on their presence. Cox, responsible for overseeing House Font's finances, expressed regret for the impromptu visit. Duke Agnes dismissed Cox's apologies, instead extending an invitation for Cox to join his service. This suggestion elicited a sharp retort from Cheryl, who condemned the Duke's audacity in attempting to poach talent. Cox attempted to intervene, urging Cheryl to cease her tirade. But Cheryl's fiery demeanor only served to reaffirm Duke Agnes's perception of her. Her spirited rebuttal hinted at a deeper resolve, one that commanded respect. As Cheryl conveyed news of Babel's advancement to C-rank knighthood, Duke Agnes couldn't help but wonder if he was truly conversing with the esteemed Cheryl D. Font. If the rumors were indeed true, Cheryl mused, perhaps it was time for her own talents to be recognized. Count Cox, visibly taken aback by Cheryl's audacity, urged her to rein in her words. Apologizing once more to Duke Agnes for the disruption, Cox attempted to defuse the tension. Duke Agnes, however, dismissed the incident with a wave of his hand, remarking that Cheryl's spirited nature was befitting of her youth. His attention then turned to Fonsel Jean Rebecca, whom he had nearly overlooked. Offering his apologies to Rebecca, Duke Agnes acknowledged his presence. As Iceland greeted Duke Agnes, Cheryl's frustration became palpable. She couldn't fathom why Iceland was present and voiced her curiosity. Cheryl's inquiry shifted to Joshua, Duke Agnes's illegitimate child, and the rumors surrounding his supposed defeat of three centurions. Count Cox's patience wore thin as he admonished Cheryl to refrain from further questioning. Unperturbed, Cheryl grumbled about her harmless curiosity, prompting Chiffon to intervene. Dispelling the rumors, Chiffon explained that Joshua not only possessed a frail constitution but was also burdened with a mana curse. This revelation left Fonsel astonished, prompting him to inquire further about Joshua's condition. Duke Agnes seized the moment, sensing an opportunity to gain insight into Joshua's condition. Addressing Fonsel, he acknowledged Fonsel's expertise as one of the Empire's few fifth-class magicians. Duke Agnes reasoned that Fonsel's sensitivity to mana surpassed his own as a knight, thus requesting Fonsel to examine Joshua. Fonsel, recognizing the chance to earn favor with Duke Agnes, readily agreed to the proposition. Meanwhile, Chiffon interjected, suggesting that it might be prudent to assess Joshua's mana deficiency before proceeding. This, Chiffon argued, would not only validate the rumors but also provide clarity regarding Joshua's condition. Intrigued by Chiffon's proposal, Duke Agnes sought clarification on how such confirmation could be achieved. Chiffon proposed summoning a suitable knight from their ranks to spar with Joshua, allowing them to gauge his abilities firsthand. Duke Agnes, however, questioned the necessity of pitting a member of the Crimson Knights against a mere nine-year-old. Chiffon asserted that if Joshua indeed possessed the strength rumored, then his opponent should be of a comparable caliber. Fortunately, Chiffon claimed to have just the right individual under their banner to serve as Joshua's sparring partner. With this person's involvement, Chiffon believed Duke Agnes would be fully convinced. The following day, in Chiffon's office, Kane received a report regarding his altercation with the Centurions. Confirming the incident, Kane acknowledged his responsibility to enforce immediate punishment under military law. However, Chiffon questioned the hastiness of Kane's actions. Defending his actions, Kane explained that the Centurions had posed a threat to a lady of the Duke's household. Chiffon's anger flared upon hearing this, presuming the target to be Lady Vanessa. Kane clarified that it was, in fact, Lady Lucia who was in danger. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Chiffon acknowledged Lady Lucia's status within the Duke's household. Kane stood firm, asserting that the soldier's actions not only insulted but also challenged the authority of the Duke. He accepted full accountability for his actions, prepared to face any punishment deemed necessary. Chiffon, Momentarily stunned by Kane's resolve, eventually relented, opting to overlook the matter for the time being. However, Chiffon swiftly redirected Kane's attention to a new task at hand. Kane, ever dutiful, awaited Chiffon's instruction. With a solemn tone, Chiffon revealed that Kane would engage in a spar with young Master Joshua that day. This revelation caught Kane off guard, but Chiffon explained the purpose. The Duke would determine whether Joshua was truly afflicted by the mana curse. Expressing concern, Chiffon remarked on the potential ramifications of such an outcome, fearing it could impede young Master Babel's progress. 
King questioned whether Shaphan implied that Babel might be sidelined due to Joshua's abilities. Enraged, Shaphan dismissed the notion, extolling Babel's unparalleled genius, a talent unmatched across the continent. Shaphan's words echoed in Cain's mind, questioning whether he believed young Master Babel could be so easily overshadowed. The image of Joshua, not as a mere pebble but as a meteor hurtling through the heavens, flashed vividly before Cain's eyes. Shaphan continued, outlining Cain's role in the upcoming spar, subtly injecting mana into Joshua's system without detection. Cain understood the gravity of this task. Injecting mana into someone cursed with the mana affliction was akin to administering poison, a death sentence within ten days. Despite Shaphan's allegiance to young Master Babel, Cain found it unsettling that Shaphan would reveal his true intentions so brazenly. With a final directive from Shaphan, Cain made his way to the military armament, where the Duke and the Count were to convene. Though the order came from his direct superior, Cain couldn't shake the unease gnawing at him. With a firm resolve, Cain assured himself that he harbored no ill intentions toward young Master Joshua. However, when Joshua entered the room and learned of the impending spar with Cain, the air crackled with tension. Cain explained the situation, citing Duke Agnes's order to confirm Joshua's abilities. Joshua, sensing an opportunity to showcase his prowess, felt a surge of determination. Yet, Cain reassured him that their spar would be nothing more than a formality, prompting a scoff from Joshua. Refusing to be underestimated, Joshua asserted his authority to choose his subordinates, expressing disdain for those he deemed unworthy. Cain, taken aback by Joshua's assertiveness, listened intently as Joshua challenged him to witness his true strength. Joshua urged Cain to give his best effort as Duke Agnes entered the room, accompanied by a retinue including other counts. Cain respectfully greeted the Duke, while Shaphan observed Joshua's lack of etiquette toward Duke Agnes with frustration. However, Joshua surprised everyone by offering a courteous greeting to the Duke. Duke Agnes feels pleased when he sees Joshua greeting someone. The Duke then tells Joshua that he doesn't recall specifically teaching him etiquette, but notes that Joshua seems skilled in it regardless. Shaphan becomes frustrated upon witnessing this interaction. Joshua reassures the Duke by explaining that he's simply learned by observing. Curious, the Duke asks Joshua if he's aware of the current situation. Joshua replies to Duke Agnes, informing him that he was informed about the Duke's intention to test him. Shaphan interjected, clarifying that the meeting was not a test but rather Duke Agnes's consideration to assess and address Joshua's condition. Joshua, sensing Shaphan's ulterior motives and allegiance to Babel, felt a pang of resentment. Duke Agnes confirmed their readiness to proceed. Cain assured Duke Agnes of his readiness, awaiting the order to commence. However, Duke Agnes intervened, addressing a misunderstanding. He clarified that Joshua's sparring partner was not Cain but rather Babel. This unexpected revelation left Joshua visibly frustrated. Duke Agnes, a stern figure with an air of authority, gathered Joshua and Babel for their training session. He briskly informed them that they would be using wooden swords, emphasizing the competitive nature of their practice. Babel, a confident young man with a hint of arrogance, agreed with a casual of course, signaling his readiness for the challenge. As he picked up his wooden sword, he made a remark about not intending to exert his full effort, a statement that caught Joshua off guard. Joshua, a determined and competitive individual, couldn't help but feel suspicious. He observed Babel and Shaphan. To Joshua, it seemed as though they were putting on a show, perhaps to overwhelm him. Fueled by this suspicion and his own competitive spirit, Joshua grabbed a wooden sword, intending to demonstrate his own prowess. With a swift motion, Joshua snapped the wooden sword in half, surprising both Shaphan and the Duke. Undeterred, he opted for an unconventional choice, a simple stick. This decision raised eyebrows among the onlookers, with Cheryl finding it amusing and Shaphan expressing confusion. However, Duke Agnes, recognizing Joshua's determination, intervened. He questioned Joshua's confidence in using the stick instead of a sword, then Duke Agnes intervenes, halting Shaphan's actions. He turns to Joshua and asks if he's sure about using the stick instead of a wooden sword. Joshua reassures the Duke, affirming his confidence. Upon hearing this, Duke Agnes instructs everyone to take their seats. Duke Agnes issued a directive. Babel was not to use mana. During the duel, Babel, with a smirk, assured Duke Agnes that he wouldn't need it against Joshua. The two opponents squared off, their gazes locked in intense concentration. Meanwhile, Cain, a bystander observing the match, wondered about Joshua's strategy. As Duke Agnes begins the match, Joshua swiftly takes the offensive, launching a strike towards Babel. However, Babel manages to evade Joshua's attack. 
Observing this, Joshua reflects on the rumors that Babel is merely a C-rank knight and relies solely on his speed. As Babel moves into counter, Joshua manages to land a strike on Babel's arm with a stick. Frustrated by the unexpected blow, Babel retaliated with renewed vigor. However, Joshua surprised him once again, using the stick to strike Babel squarely in the stomach. Despite the intensity of the attack, Babel managed to endure the blow, his resolve unshaken. Meanwhile, Joshua remained focused, already planning his next move as the match continued. Babel's aggressive maneuver caught everyone off guard as he swiftly launched an offensive, utilizing his mana to unleash a formidable attack on Joshua. Duke Agnes, the authoritative figure overseeing the training, immediately intervened, commanding Babel to halt his assault. However, Babel, driven by determination or perhaps defiance, disregarded the order, resulting in a massive explosion of blue aura that reverberated throughout the training area. As the dust settled, the scene unfolded with a surprising revelation. Joshua had managed to block Babel's attack using his own mana. It was a moment of astonishment for all present, witnessing Joshua, a mere nine-year-old, harnessing and releasing mana with such mastery. Babel, visibly taken aback by Joshua's unexpected display of power, grew frustrated, resorting to drawing his sword and asserting his claim as the rightful successor to the duchy. In response to Babel's challenge, Joshua steeled himself, realizing the gravity of the situation. With thoughts racing through his mind, he contemplated the significance of this confrontation, aware of the implications it held not only for himself but also for the future of the duchy. His determination to prove himself and secure his position surged within him, driving him to prepare for the impending clash. As tensions mounted and both combatants prepared to engage, Duke Agnes intervened once more, his authoritative presence compelling them to cease their actions. With a stern admonition, he warned Babel of the consequences of defying his authority, effectively quelling any further aggression. Babel, stunned by the reprimand, begrudgingly relented, his frustration momentarily subdued. Amidst the commotion, Shafan, an onlooker, expressed his astonishment. Joshua's ability to wield mana at such a young age, his incredulity, underscored the unprecedented nature of Joshua's feat, leaving him and others present in awe of his untapped potential. Duke Agnes, seizing the opportunity to address lingering rumors regarding Joshua's abilities, pointed to this display of mana manipulation as validation of his exceptional talent. Count Fonsel, though acknowledging Joshua's proficiency with mana, noted a distinction in the manner of his usage compared to Babel's. This observation highlighted the uniqueness of Joshua's mana concentration and its potential significance in shaping future events. The revelation of Joshua's newfound power left both Cain and Cheryl, spectators to the unfolding events, surprised and intrigued by the implications it held. Duke Agnes complimented Joshua on his remarkable ability to wield mana at the tender age of nine, acknowledging the feat as truly impressive. However, before the conversation could progress further, Shafan attempted to interject, suggesting an alternative explanation for Joshua's abilities. With a stern expression, Duke Agnes swiftly silenced Shafan, signaling that his input is unwelcomed. Recognizing the seriousness of the situation, Shafan promptly retreated, deferring to Duke Agnes's authority. Duke Agnes informed Joshua that there were matters he needed to discuss and requested his presence in his office later that evening. The unexpected summons surprised both Shafan and Babel, with Babel expressing frustration at the unusual nature of the request. He couldn't comprehend how a child who once lived in the stables could now be summoned to the Duke's chambers. Meanwhile, Joshua calmly accepted Duke Agnes's invitation, acknowledging that he would indeed attend the meeting. The scene then shifted to the guest room, where Cheryl, overwhelmed with excitement, joyously bounced on the bed. Count Cox, attempting to maintain decorum, gently urged Lady Cheryl to calm down. Cheryl, reflecting on the situation, found it incredulous that a nine-year-old could possess the ability to wield mana. Despite her initial disbelief, Cheryl made a firm decision. She was determined to make Joshua hers. The scene transitions to the grandeur of the palace, where Duchess Vanessa's frustration flares upon hearing from Chiffon that Babel has been defeated by Joshua in a match. In her disbelief, she impulsively slaps Chiffon, unable to comprehend how Joshua could have acquired the ability to wield mana and surpass Babel, her own son. She demands clarification from Chiffon regarding Duke Agnes's intentions. Chiffon explains that it appears Duke Agnes is considering taking Joshua to the city of Akadi, presumably to further assess his talents. This revelation leaves both Duchess Vanessa and Chiffon apprehensive about their future prospects considering the potential implications of Joshua's newfound abilities. 
Duchess Vanessa, quick to assign blame, chastises Chiffon for the predicament, but he offers reassurance, claiming to have a plan to address the situation. Chiffon's analysis extends further, suggesting that Duke Agnes might exploit Joshua's abilities by spreading the notion that he is a C-rank mana user throughout the Empire. Duchess Vanessa initially dismisses this notion, but Chiffon persists, pointing out that the eyewitness accounts of the two counts could corroborate such claims. He predicts that Duke Agnes will likely subject Joshua to a test, aiming to officially knight him as a Searank knight. This test would involve a battle against a royal knight, serving as a demonstration of Joshua's mana usage capabilities. The prospect of Joshua facing off against a royal knight intrigues Duchess Vanessa, momentarily alleviating her frustration as she envisions the potential outcomes. Her thoughts drift to her uncle, whom she decides to contact for the first time in a while. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to Joshua, who arrives at Duke Agnes's office as summoned. Upon entering, he greets the Duke respectfully, but his demeanor quickly shifts as Duke Agnes begins to probe deeper. The Duke questions Joshua about his true identity and whether any resentment festers within him towards Duke Agnes himself. Caught off guard by the unexpected line of questioning, Joshua maintains his composure and assures Duke Agnes that he harbors no ill feelings towards him. Joshua approached Duke Agnes with a proposition, acknowledging the cautious environment of the royal castle where expectations for him might have been low. However, he expressed a request, piquing Duke Agnes's interest. Duke Agnes, anticipating an apology request, queried Joshua's intentions. But Joshua, aware of the futility of shallow apologies in the castle's harsh milieu, clarified that his request concerned Duke Agnes taking him to Akadi. Duke Agnes, curious about Joshua's certainty, probed further, questioning if Joshua indeed expected Duke Agnes to take him to the city. Joshua affirmed his conviction, prompting Duke Agnes to seek clarification on the reasons behind Joshua's confidence. Joshua elaborated, citing two primary reasons for his conviction. Firstly, he pointed out the disruption his presence had caused in the assumed succession plan. Traditionally, Babel was presumed to be Duke Agnes's successor, but Joshua's emergence challenged this norm, potentially leading to chaos. Joshua believed his departure could help avert such turmoil, demonstrating his astute understanding of the castle's dynamics. Impressed by Joshua's insight, Duke Agnes recognized him not only as a talented fighter but also as a strategic thinker. Secondly, Joshua highlighted Duke Agnes's personal reluctance to let him go. If Joshua could surpass Duke Agnes in skill, it would elevate the Agnes family's status and diminish concerns about the castle's vulnerability. Duke Agnes, intrigued by Joshua's boldness, questioned whether Joshua believed he had the power to effect such significant changes. Joshua, exuding confidence, assured him of his determination not to disappoint. Excited by Joshua's resolve, Duke Agnes concluded that Joshua must have a plan to achieve both his desires simultaneously. Joshua confirmed Duke Agnes' assumption, revealing his awareness of the potential plan to send him to the prestigious academy in Akadi. At the academy, noble children of the Avalon Empire received a six-year education from ages 10 to 15. Remarkably skilled individuals, such as Babel, could even graduate early. The academy served as a conduit for the royal family to recruit promising talent directly solidifying their control over the nobility. In an effort to maintain the loyalty of the nobles towards the royal family and attract exceptional talents, Duke Agnes confides in Joshua, revealing that he will be accompanying him to the city. Moreover, he assures Joshua of occasional personal tutoring sessions if he remains close by. Upon hearing this, Joshua perceives it as a remarkable opportunity to glean insights into swordsmanship from one of the empire's renowned masters. Eagerly, he expresses his willingness to accompany the duke and receive his tutelage. However, Joshua harbors a preference for the spear as his weapon of choice. Duke Agnes is taken aback by this revelation, his initial enthusiasm dampened by Joshua's unexpected choice. He recalls Joshua's previous use of what he deems a useless stick in a one-on-one -on -one battle, causing frustration to simmer within him. As his temper flares, Duke Agnes emanates a potent aura, visibly agitated by Joshua's decision. In the face of the Duke's imposing presence, Joshua finds it increasingly difficult to maintain his composure. Yet, just as Duke Agnes takes pride in his mastery of the sword, Joshua remains steadfast in his own pride regarding his proficiency with the spear. In a bold proclamation, Joshua confides in Duke Agnes, declaring his intent to vanquish anyone obstructing his path with the prowess of his spear, even if they happen to be among the esteemed nine stars, of which Duke Agnes is a part. Amused by Joshua's audacious declaration, 
Duke Agnes finds a sense of humor in the notion that Joshua is determined to overcome the formidable Nine Stars. Capitalizing on the moment, Duke Agnes challenges Joshua, expressing a desire to witness firsthand the worth of Joshua's spear. Intrigued and recognizing this as a rare opportunity, Joshua contemplates the challenge, realizing that Duke Agnes is indeed one of the Nine Stars. Without hesitation, Duke Agnes queries Joshua about his willingness to undertake the test. Seizing the moment, Joshua agrees to the test but presents a condition. If he successfully passes Duke Agnes's trial, the Duke must acquiesce to a personal request Joshua harbors. Duke Agnes, in his characteristic manner, agrees to Joshua's terms, stating that should Joshua prove himself, not only will he gain the privilege of wielding a spear, but Duke Agnes will also heed Joshua's request. However, Duke Agnes sternly informs Joshua that should he fail the test, he will be bound to follow the Duke's commands. Joshua contemplates this consequence, realizing that it may entail enrolling in the academy and honing his skills in swordsmanship, a path he had no intention of taking. Despite his reservations, Joshua accepts the Duke's proposal, inwardly confident that he will not falter. He resolves not to conceal his abilities, determined to face whatever challenges may arise head-on. Meanwhile, the scene transitions to Duchess Vanessa, who engages in a magical communication with her uncle residing in the city. As they exchange greetings, Duchess Vanessa reveals that an incident has occurred within the duchy and seeks her uncle's assistance, hinting at a forthcoming favor. Joshua stepped out of Duke Agnes's office, his mind still reeling from the encounter. As he stood outside, bathed in the dim light of the corridor, he couldn't help but marvel at the mastery displayed by the formidable Duke. To Joshua, it was clear that Duke Agnes was truly exceptional, living up to his reputation as a master of his craft. Lost in his thoughts, Joshua was startled by the sudden appearance of Babel. Babel wasted no time and asked Joshua to divulge the details of his conversation with Duke Agnes. However, Joshua, still processing the encounter himself, deflected Babel's inquiry with a casual dismissal. He had nothing to report, he claimed, attempting to brush off the conversation as inconsequential. But Babel was not one to be easily dissuaded. With a determined gaze, he insisted that they engage in another battle. Joshua couldn't help but notice the intensity in Babel's eyes, a fervent desire for victory and an unwavering determination to never taste defeat. It was a gaze that spoke volumes, revealing Babel's pure passion for the thrill of combat. With a smirk, Joshua teasingly questioned Babel's confidence, playfully testing the waters to gauge his opponent's resolve. Meanwhile, in the opulent halls of the Avalon Empire's Grand Imperial Palace, Emperor Marcus Van Britten received news of Joshua's exploits. The Emperor's interest was piqued as he learned of yet another prodigious talent emerging from the Agnes Empire. Emperor Marcus mentions that his older sister, Vanessa, had been concealing someone like the kid in question. The green-haired individual informs the Emperor that the child is not the Duchess's offspring, but rather an illegitimate one. Rumors suggest he is the child of a maid from the Duchy. Emperor Marcus finds this revelation intriguing. He considers Babel to be a unique treasure that he won't encounter again within the Empire. However, now Duke Agnes possesses two treasures all to himself. Expressing envy, Emperor Marcus admits to feeling truly jealous. The green-haired man adds that the princes are also talented individuals destined to make a significant impact on the world. Hearing this, Emperor Marcus reflects on the scarcity of individuals born with the talent for rulership but lacking in combat prowess. However, the emperor expressed disappointment in the current crop of princes, lamenting their lack of martial prowess compared to their aspirations for rulership. The green-haired companion disagreed, suggesting that perhaps the emperor's standards were too high, influenced by his own mastery and desire for excellence. It was a perspective that forced Emperor Marcus to reassess his expectations and consider the possibility that talent came in many forms, not solely confined to the battlefield. In the midst of this discussion, Emperor Marcus couldn't shake the envy he felt towards Duke Agnes, who now possessed not one, but two prized treasures within his grasp. The revelation left Emperor Marcus pondering the future implications of Duke Agnes's decision to unveil his second child to the world. It means that this child could rival Babel in skill, marking them as a significant presence within their world. A green-haired informant relayed rumors to Emperor Marcus, claiming that Babel had been defeated by this nine-year-old prodigy. The emperor, astonished by the notion of a child surpassing seasoned warriors, found amusement in the situation predicting a rush of interest in witnessing the child's abilities firsthand. Confirming the emperor's assumptions, the informant revealed that the Agni's duchy had requested the dispatch of the imperial castle's order of knights, 
indicating the child's advanced skill level, potentially nearing that of a C-rank knight. Emperor Marcus marveled at the child's extraordinary talent, considering it a stroke of fortune for the empire. His curiosity peaked, he recognized the potential significance of Duke Agnes's second child. However, the emperor also acknowledged the inherent dangers surrounding the child due to his own vast influence, making him a prime target for nefarious interests. Despite his desire to personally evaluate the child's abilities, Emperor Marcus deemed it impractical due to the lurking threats. Instead, he proposed sending a prince to assess the child's talents, stressing the importance of recognizing and nurturing exceptional abilities. The narrative then returned to the intense combat between Joshua and Babel. Joshua unleashed a formidable strike infused with mana, which Babel skillfully countered with his sword. Despite the unexpected discovery of mana in Joshua's bare fist, Babel remained composed. Sensing Babel's thoughts, Joshua boldly vowed to showcase the true power of the martial arts that had captured Babel's interest. Irritated by Joshua's confident assertion, Babel responded with a fierce swing of his mana-infused sword. The clash between Joshua and Babel crescendoed as Joshua unleashed a powerful strike, his fist infused with mana, sending Babel sprawling to the ground. Confusion and frustration clouded Babel's mind as he grappled with the reality of Joshua's ability to channel mana into his body, a feat beyond his comprehension. Despite his inner turmoil, Babel couldn't deny the stark truth. Joshua's strength eclipsed his own by far. Approaching Babel with a mix of empathy and seriousness, Joshua sought to understand the source of Babel's frustration. With a firm gaze, Joshua urged Babel to harness his frustration into a drive for improvement, reminding him of the humiliation of being defeated by someone he once dismissed. While Joshua possessed the power to obliterate Babel for his insults against him and his mother, he recognized a genuine spark of passion for martial prowess in Babel's eyes. However, Joshua's mercy was not without conditions. He issued a stern warning. If Babel persisted in his disrespectful attitude, Joshua would ensure he never wielded a sword again. Shocked by the gravity of Joshua's words, Babel grappled with the weight of his actions as Joshua departed, leaving him to contemplate the vast disparity in their current skill levels. As the morning sun filtered through the windows of the Agnes Duchy Palace, Joshua found himself still weary from the previous day's exertions. Reflecting on the newfound freedom in his mana control since absorbing Lukia's essence, Joshua couldn't help but ponder the toll it might be taking on his body, considering the lingering side effects. A soft knock interrupted Joshua's reverie, and he assumed it was Cain, arriving ahead of schedule as usual. However, to his surprise, it was Cheryl who stood at the door. As Cheryl introduced herself, she casually mentioned that she had heard Joshua was three years younger than her. With this knowledge in mind, Cheryl felt at ease speaking to Joshua. Playfully, she suggested he address her as Big Sister. With a sense of familiarity, Cheryl ventured into Joshua's room, intending to have a conversation. However, before she could proceed, Joshua abruptly halted her and whispered in her ear to leave his room. Startled by a sudden change in demeanor, Cheryl watched in astonishment as Joshua slammed the door shut behind her. Outside, Cheryl stood in stunned silence, bewildered by Joshua's sudden dismissal. Moments later, another knock echoed through the room. Irritated by the interruption, Joshua flung the door open, only to find Cain standing on the other side, his unexpected presence catching Joshua off guard. Surprised by Joshua's unexpected demeanor, Cain hesitated before speaking. He informed Joshua that he could return later if Joshua was occupied. Joshua, realizing his mistake, quickly apologized to Cain, acknowledging the mix-up. Taking a moment to gather his thoughts, Joshua then inquired about the progress of a task he had assigned to Cain. Cain confirmed that he had completed the preparations as instructed but expressed confusion regarding the purpose behind Joshua's directives. Joshua's smile widened as he reassured Cain, urging him to trust and follow along. He cryptically hinted that Cain would soon understand the reasoning behind his actions.